Farm Bureau insurance agent in any of the 82 counties in the state of Mississippi. Farm Bureau insurance. We're streaming live on the Out of Bounds radio app. You can watch the show right now on YouTube. Search Out of Bounds Sports or Facebook search the Out of Bounds show. Tom Luganbill joins us, National College Football Analyst with ESPN. And he joins us on the Corona Premier guest line. All right, Tom Luganbill, I want you to put on your general manager hat and I'm going to fire some questions at you like you were an NFL GM. Um, next week, the draft's going off. You're a general manager. All the quarterbacks are on the board, and you have a pick, and you can pick any of them in the first round. Who would you go with and why? Oh, I'd, boy, I'd go with our boy at Ole Miss. Like I've talked about for what? Has it been like 18 months now we've been having this conversation? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I think – He's one. Kenny Pickett would be one A for me. Um, you know, our, our our boy at Liberty, for as gifted and talented as he is, he's just too streaky for me. I'm I'm very concerned about streakiness at, at the NFL, uh, at the NFL level. I just th- that's something that I think um, is can be troublesome because if that's how a guy has performed for a number of years there's a high likelihood that that's exactly what he's going to be, right? I don't know if you coach that out of a guy that's 23 years old or 22 years old. So um, that's, that's where I, I would be at. Um, I just think that with the way the game at the NFL level has evolved, the ability to have to get the ball out quick, have to get the ball out with different arm angles and off platform and off balance and be able to run at a high rate of speed, be able to make plays with your legs, uh, it's just, to me, that's that's the direction you go in. All right. Will you describe to our listeners the difference in the window uh, throwing for a quarterback from college to the NFL? <laughs> Man, I think sometimes it can be as, as, as big as two hand lengths. Okay. So this question you're asking is interesting because it actually ties into the value of, combine setting type measurable there's a reason why we high we 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 measure hand size there's a reason why we measure uh arm reach and then overall wingspan there's a reason why we measure from the hip to the bottom of the feet um length you hear coaches use that term length all the time well guess what length does length closes windows length uh closes the gap in space and so if you start having elite athletes versus elite athletes, it's difficult for the smaller guys to perform in today's game. And so to me, I think that it's not just about the, the window tightening, I think, and it's not just about the arm strength to compensate for it. Because now you start to get into that conversation of anticipation, rhythm, and timing. Because if you are in sync with your guys, All right, you're in sync with, um, let's just say, the offense, the scheme. You know exactly what's asked of you. You know exactly where the ball's got to go. You know exactly who's going to be there, and you know when he's going to be there. That's how you beat the closed windows, you know, and everything's going to be on top of all that, Bo. I think the thing that we probably gloss over here is we always have this conversation about recruiting and how steep the learning curve is from high school to college, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a learning curve there because the game just vastly speeds up. Well, then it does again, too. Even for the premier or the premier at the collegiate level, you jump into that NFL basket, and now it accelerates even more. So, so much of this stuff, I think, is, is mental and work ethic related, maybe more so than it is physical attributes. All right. Do you believe coaches differ on this, which they, they do on everything, but um... – <laughs> As far as coaching accuracy, so oh, I think you can. So I look at what I know he's not the hot name right now, but I, I look at what Dan Mullen did with Dak Prescott, who was very yeah. rough around the edges coming from North Louisiana, and and took you know he needed a lot of development and coaching to get where he got by about his redshirt junior year. Uh, mm-hmm. So as a as a you played Power Five QB. You've coached in the pros, coached college, 
your dad's mm-hmm. been a coach forever. Can you coach accuracy, Tom? You can improve it. I don't think you can, that you can coach the innate portion of it, the portion that is just internal. You either have it or you don't have it. Like, for example, DJ Uyangole does not have an innate ability to be accurate. It is a real struggle for him. I don't know um, if our guy at Liberty has that that innate. I don't think he does, but you know okay. more than I do. Right. I do think Bryce Young does. Like I, I do think um, C.J. Stroud does. And when you watch quarterbacks, when you look at them, one of the things that I always tell guys when I'm working with them is, think of it in these terms: if you force the the, the receiver to have to make adjustments, you're limiting your own yards to your stat sheet. So let's just say you got a little five yard crossing route in front of you. And I would always teach that we want to throw that ball one foot in front of the number. So as he's running laterally and away from you, you place that ball one foot from his chest right in front of the numbers. You're giving him what I call a transitional football where he takes that ball and now he immediately can transition upfield without having to make adjustments, without having to make an awkward coordination of how he snags the ball. That's the difference of making that awkward change and adjustment and getting tackled by, by a trailing defender at six yards and the ball being thrown a foot in front of the numbers, you transition, you turn up, and now that five-yard catch turns into a 17 or 29 or 64-yard reception, all right? And that wasn't created by scheme. That was created by accuracy. And so I think you can drill accuracy from footwork to all those different types of things. And you can get better at it. But when the live bullets start flying, quarterback play is about two things, decision-making and accuracy. Put them whatever order you want to put them in. But they're about those two things. And you're going to have to be able to innately anticipate, understand timing. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, throw guys open, where the guy's yeah. not where he needs to be yet, but you're going to take him there because you know that's the void in the coverage or what have you. So to me, I think you can work it, but I don't think you can just all of a sudden take a guy that's highly talented physically who sprays the ball around, and then all of a sudden, three years later, you turn him into a guy that can't miss. I don't think that happens. I think that's ego. I think that's ego heavily involved in private quarterback tutoring. All right. What Tom Luganville on the Out of Bounds show, if he was a general manager, he had the pick and everybody's on the board next week he would go Matt Corral and so do you believe that Corral is the most accurate over Kenny I I know he he is over Malik Willis but over Kenny Pickett and Ritter am I missing one more that's kind of been who Uh, yes eh, Sam Howell's not in the discussion I I would say that Sam has been and proven to be at least on tape maybe the most accurate deep ball thrower of the group. But short and intermediate stuff has not always been overly, overly accurate. So to answer the question about Matt Corral, I think as a total package, whether it's the three-step game, five-step game, whether it's your shotgun, whether it's uh, bootlegs and nakeds and things off platform or things that are out of the pocket, if you took all of them and combined them together, he's probably the most accurate of the group. If you took – and you just said, all right, we're just going to play from within the pocket, out of the shotgun. I think Kenny Pickett is seriously in that conversation. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I have really mixed feelings on Desmond, and I think I have them because for whatever reason, the games that I did, the COVID year, gosh, I felt like I was the face of the group of five. You know, we were, <laughs> we were broadcasting, <laughs> broadcasting all these games out of a broom closet here in Charlotte, so we were never on site, but we had – you know, Tulsa SMU, SMU Cincinnati, Cincinnati Navy, Cincinnati Houston. So I saw a lot of him, and I thought he was very hot and cold. When he's on, he's as good as there is. When he's off, you really scratch your head and kind of wonder, what's he doing? You know, that type of thing. And so the consistency side of things for Desmond Ritter, to me, is slightly concerning, but I think you also have a guy who was a late bloomer out of high school, a late developer at the collegiate level, and so he still has a high feeling for development 
at the NFL level, especially if you're in the market for a guy that you don't have to play right away with. All right. We're going to stay on some of the players, but I want to, I want to go to Lane Kiffin real quick. Uh, we talked within the first 24 hours when Lane was hired at Ole Miss. You loved mm-hmm. it for the jump. He's had a lot of success since going to Oxford. We talked about, you know, he's grown up, all, you know, but he's, he's just brilliant on offense. He just kind of maybe needed the maturity piece and so on. He got mm-hmm. that the last eight or nine years, whatever. Do you think now, today's Lane Kiffin, do you think today's Lane Kiffin would work in the NFL, Tom? Oh, um, actually, yes. I, I absolutely do believe that. But there's so many different components to, to that element. So, for example, um, obviously the game of football is a quarterback-driven game. But in the National Football League, it's really a quarterback-driven game. I mean, I, I always pose this question to everybody. If Drew Brees passes the physical of the Miami Dolphins, is Nick Saban ever at Alabama? That's a great question. And I, my answer is no. And to be honest with you, I've had that conversation with Coach Saban. And he chuckles and goes, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he so, I mean, so you just you think about how important that position is, and then you ramp it up times 10 when you get in the National Football League. The other side to it is, unlike the collegiate side, where the coaches are heavily involved in not only player identification and player evaluation, but the actual recruitment and the decision-making of the player you are taking, that's not always the case at the National Football League level, depending on how you're structured. You have a general manager, player personnel side that handles all of that, and the coaches just coach the guys they take, or you may have uh, a Bill Belichick, a Bill Parcells type scenario where the head coach, no matter what, is going to have the final decision on draft selection and free agent signings and all that stuff. So th- to answer that question, it's hard to know how accurate you could be answering it without knowing which one of those scenarios he were to step into. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Be- because that, that, is a, that is a big, big – like I used to always – when we were as a staff, when we were in NFL Europe, and then in the XFL, and to some degree even in the Arena Football League when I was bouncing around a little bit, is those what we call free agent draft leagues, which means that you're building your entire roster through a draft of available players that may have been on NFL rosters for two years, practice squad, maybe five years, or what have you. They're out there. There's a ton of them. They're really good players with good football left. And we used to always discuss as a, as a, as a staff, because in those leagues, the co- it's like college. The coaches do handle the personnel. And they do handle the draft, and they do make those decisions. And we used to always talk as a staff, listen, we'll beat our opponents if we do a fantastic job in player evaluation and make the right choices in building our roster. Now, barring injury or unforeseen circumstances, if you get a quarterback and you draft well, you're going to win in those types of leagues, right? right? So, again, it's all about player evaluation and the choices you make but who all is involved? How many hands in the cookie jar do you have? And I think that's a, a valid question. So there's outliers to everything that we discuss with you or anybody else. And we, I just asked you about accuracy. I love the mm-hmm. answer. Where do you go with Josh Allen with the Buffalo Bills? Um, it, it looked like he was struggled at the collegiate level, struggled yeah. his first couple years at Buffalo. Is he just an outlier? Is it Brian Dayball? Where do you go with the with the Josh Allen, Luke's? So you're so right. I mean, I, I was I was you know hit or miss with him coming out. He was hurt a lot. He wasn't always overly accurate. He turned the ball over a lot, and he was one of those guys that you always guard against, right? Don't get enamored with the physical attributes and let them cloud some other areas that really need to be scrutinized, right? So whatever it was that the job the Buffalo Bills did, they hit on this one. I mean, bottom line, that's the reality. They hit on this one, and good, and good for them. It's just it's such a hard position to, to project. You're trying to, you're trying to uncover every single red flag that you can. You're trying to figure out, you know, what, what is going to make the difference between this being a guy and him fading away and, and not being a guy – I think the answer to that question in many regards is two things. 
work ethic, and do you love the game? Because if you love the game, you'll have the work ethic to work at it as a professional, not as a guy who just plays the sport of football, but as a guy that's the first person in the building and the last person out. You know, and I think, to be honest with you, I think Josh Allen has those attributes. I think he is a tireless worker. We know the physical attributes. And you know what? For the most part, Bo, he's been able to stay healthy. Sure. I, yeah. I think that's a big part of it, too, is when you're not missing time and you're not losing reps and you're not getting valuable game experience because you're injured, a, you know, that's a big deal. Tom Luganbill on the Corona Premier guest line. Uh, and some franchises would not even have given him the time that Buffalo gave him and would have, you know, the NFL, as you know, is fickle. And I mean, it's right now, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. microwave league, uh, you know, some, some franchises would have moved off of him, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, listen, I think that whatever their long-term vision was, whatever the other decisions that they were planning on making, whether it be in free agency, whether it be through the draft, they must have been very, very convinced that they were close to putting the pieces around him that were going to help him the most, right? Because it's, it, it's about the quarterback, but then it's also about who you put around the quarterback. I mean, I, I was in an event uh, last month with, with Kurt Warner, and we were talking about our NFL Europe days, and we were talking about the, the, the Rams and this and that. Well, not his performance, his performance as a St. Louis Ram notwithstanding, let's just assume for a second that when that whole situation with him happened and Trent Green happened, what if the running back's not Marshall Falk? What if the wideouts are not Isaac uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce Torrey Holt, and Oz Hakeem? Like, think about those. Like, what if Orlando Pace isn't the left tackle? Like, those are all unbelievably valid questions as to whether or not the St. Louis Rams under Dick Vermeil and Mike Martz on the offensive leadership side, what if, those, what if that wasn't the personnel they had? Would the story still be the same? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't feel overly confident that they would go to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. But, again, it goes back to the, the Jimmys and the Joes, not the X's and the O's. All right. We, out of bounds, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. We're visiting with Tom Luganbill, National College Football Analyst with ESPN, and he joins us on the Corona Premier Guest Line. All right, I want to go to Baker Mayfield. There's all this back and forth. Um, yeah. He's a great story in college, a walk-on, bounces around, ends up at Oklahoma. But Oklahoma has been dominating with whoever's been the signal caller because Stoops was so good and Lincoln didn't miss a beat. And that, that conference has been going the wrong way in recruiting. And their bell cow, their, their flagship program hasn't gotten it together in 10 or 12 years in Texas. So kind of mix all that up and you got to factor all that in. How do you – so he looks like a kind of a one-two, a, a starter, yeah. one-two type guy. How do you see Baker Mayfield now as he's, he may end up with the Carolina Panthers? Yeah, if we're looking at him as just a player, like I think he's got some stuff, man. I, 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 like, I like the moxie. I like the riverboat gambler mentality. Um, I, I, I think we are, we're a little too quick to discount the fact that, remember, this was, a, this was a franchise that had blew it time and time and time and time and time again. And now all of a sudden they took a guy and they did improve. They improved through free agency. They improved through the draft, but they were better at quarterback because of him. Now there's a variety and I haven't followed it, you know, ultra closely, but clearly there's some personality quirks, some, maybe some problems with either his interpersonal skills with teammates, coaches, uh, general managers. And maybe it's not all him. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a recipe of negativity. And when you're the quarterback, you take on the brunt of that responsibility. Uh, but listen, what if he's a guy that just needs a fresh start somewhere else, you right. know, because he did, he has shown some, some promise, the real promise at times. And so I, I, I think it's way too early to give up on him, but I don't know if you saw the comments from Robbie Anderson, the Carolina Panthers, the wide receiver and his, you know, what he put on Twitter, Twitter when there was, some speculation that he might get traded. And, you know, if, if that's the, the response that other players and other teams have 
when they hear about Baker Mayfield possibly coming to the team, that's not good. You know, there's, why is that? You got to really start asking some questions. What did he say? As to, he said something like it was there was it was either one of the NFL insiders from one of the networks or somebody had just said you know likely landing spot for for you know Baker Mayfield is, is the Carolina Panthers and Robbie Anderson tweets back no like end with like five O's. Ah, and it's I like, got dude, you. Dude, I mean that's not good, and you got to figure out why that is if, if you're Matt Rule and you're the management of the Carolina Panthers, but. Um, I don't know. There's still something like, like, I would be really curious. And, and I'm just, when I say this, like, who would Cliff Kingsbury rather have right now? Tyler Murray or Baker Mayfield? I Ooh. think that's a really intriguing question. Ooh, Blake just said that's a great question. Okay. Right. I mean, think about that. Like, and it's, and it's real and you're sitting there going, golly, I just, I, I think that's a just a fascinating question. Hmm. Who would you rather have, Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield? Okay. All right, let, we've only got a couple of minutes here. Let's go to SEC QBs. If Bryce Young is by far and away the number one QB returning, who who do you have as the number two QB in the Southeastern Conference? Well, on physical talent, I would have Spencer Rattler. But... Again, he's streaky, and and he's now going to a roster that was nowhere near what the one Oklahoma had. So the people around him um, may not be as good. I think that is going to be a fascinating experiment uh, in Columbia. Uh, personally, I really do. I, I think it's going to be really, really intriguing uh, to watch. You know, that's a really – it's a good question, and I don't know if I have a legitimate uh, answer for it. I think – I guess you'd probably have to say Spencer. I, okay. I don't like saying that, but I think it's fair. And, and, you know, just because he does have such a significant sample size that, that it's probably the safest pick, but I don't feel as comfortable about, you know, who's playing around him. And, and then I wasn't, you know, I wasn't overly impressed with his comments the other day either. Just let it go and move on. There's no need to make public statements about where you were. Agree. Just, just move on. Just Agree. move on. All right, we'll we'll continue this maybe next week or the next on uh, Max Johnson, AR-15, Dart, Will Rogers. Some of them haven't played much. Some of them have played a lot. All right. Dart Dart would be my dark horse guy to emerge as the second guy. Okay. All right. I can't wait to see what Napier does with his guys coming out of Florida. Tom Luganville on the Corona Premier Guest Line. Be good, buddy. See you. All right. Take care, pal. That was fun. I, I like that. Um, from Matt Corral to can you coach, teach accuracy, and then a uh, little Baker Mayfield, SEC QBs. He went Bryce Young, then Spencer Rattler, but his dark horse is uh, Jackson Dart, who will be in the Grove Bowl this weekend. The Out of Bounds Show is brought to you by Havana Smoke Shop for your premium cigars. 